Hey guys, before you tune into today's episode, I want to tell you about an opportunity where you can secure between five and six figures in corporate and government contracts. Now I know this might sound a little intimidating, especially if you've never done business at this level, or maybe you don't have a corporate background. I'm here to tell you that all of that does not matter. Did you know that only 4% of women in business hit a million dollars in revenue? And of that 4%, 56% are able to hit a million dollars in revenue because they go after these contracts. So if a million dollars is on your vision board or just overall financial stability, corporate contracts is the way to go. I wanna invite you to enjoy me in my upcoming masterclass where I'm going to show you how to create a no-brainer offer so that executive buyers do not even question giving you their money. So who exactly is this class for? If you're a seasoned nine to fiver planning for her exit, but you're unsure where to start, but you are sure that you're done building someone else's dream instead of your own, this class is for you. If you're a new entrepreneur and just overwhelmed with everything that you need to learn and accomplish and seeking out a mentor who gets it and understands, I want to see you in class. This is also for seasoned entrepreneurs who are having challenges with driving consistent revenue into their business. Now, here's the reality. You have the smarts, you have the skill set, you have the ambition, you have the thought leadership to get paid. My job is to help you package your expertise so that it becomes a no brainer for people to pay you high five and six figure contracts. So click on the link below this video or in the show notes to get more details and to sign up for the class before we sell out. I cannot wait to see you there. I was not going to let fear taking the decisions of my life. And there's something that is very liberating to be a Latina in this country. It's bet on ourselves in such a way where I feel is the ultimate true ownership of your life. What about I want to be the pilot of my Latino agenda? We produce more than $500 billion as entrepreneurs. Look at this marketer go. You are just spitting it out. I love it. When you're restricting resources, you have to be very clear about where to go so that you don't spend it wrongly. Using my Latinidad as my superpower to build the business model that will help me. You guys are hearing it first on Banking on Cultura because yeah. Gloria has never spoken about this publicly in this way anyway. Anywhere else. I am an entrepreneur. Thank you very Ladies much. and gentlemen, Claudia <laughs> Romo I'm an entrepreneur. Thank you very much. What's up, mi gente? Welcome back to Banking on Cultura, where we talk about the vibrancy and complexity of our Latino culture, entrepreneurship, and of course, all the bonchinche in between. Now, today I have a very, very special guest. I actually first saw her doing her thing on stage. I believe it was a Alpha of Women event. Shout out to Alpha. And she was just dynamite like literally she like blew up the room as soon as she opened her mouth and I was like who is this woman and I was just so intrigued because she was so passionate about Latinas and about moving the Latino agenda forward and you can tell how genuine it was you know some people get on stage and they do a really good performative act but you can literally hear in her tone in her body language in her passion the stories the way she was communicating you could tell that she was the real deal and that's what we like to present to our community here on Banking on Cultura. So let me introduce my guest. So Gloria Romo Iromen, she is a global mobilization expert, catalyst for social change, and marketer for social causes. She is a recognized speaker, media contributor, and an aspiring activist. She is the founder of the We Are All Human Foundation and co-host of the podcast A La Latina. She is a Mexican-Swiss diplomat with more than 25 years experience and get this y'all she speaks six different languages okay that is just insane and in my opinion she is a true badass with class and the perfect amount of sass gloria welcome to banking on cultura i love that <laughs> A class badass with enough sass. Yes. I love that. I never got that. But I am going to, you know, like I'm going to memorize it and Use I'm trying it. to. It is you. That is, that's how I would identify your persona. That's how I felt. I was like, oh, she's such a badass. Pero tan muy classy. Because you're very like put together and you represent us very well. But you got this like, you know, spicy too. You know, you're Latina. So hello. We got to, we got to keep it authentic in that way. So 
Very excited to have you on the show. Thank you so much for joining us. Muchas gracias. Thank you so very much. Really excited to be here. Me too. So we like to start this show with Songon Chinche. So tell us, give us give us something we can't Google about Claudia. Well, I would think that I, um, I mean, like, you know a lot about my activism. I think that, you know, um, our, or at least the community have been uh, talking about how much I believe that we can make a change. Um, but I think that you don't know that my father married 11 times, for example. Oh, wow. I did not know that. Yes. I I never say this because it just happens to be that my dad was looking for true love. Okay. And he died actually looking for true love. He was like, you know, convinced that he could do it. I was a witness on three of his weddings. So wow. there you go. 11 times. I know. The wow. Mexican Elizabeth Taylor. Wow. <laughs> I love that. I love that. And something that we discussed when we were prepping for this conversation that I was really interested in having us talk about was the fact that you represent our cultura so well and you are all about the Latino agenda and educating the world, corporate America, about why they need to pay attention to us and why, most importantly, you have to invest in us because we are the back. <laughs> like we are the future, right? But what I noticed is that you are married to a white man. And I thought that was interesting for someone to be so in love with the cultura, but choose to marry outside the cultura. So can you talk to us about why? To be honest, this was also, this is my second marriage and I was also married to a non-Mexican before. So look, I think that, this time around, um, when I moved to America 10 years ago, almost 10 years ago, in Cinco de Mayo, it's going to be my 10th anniversary. I'm going to start celebrating. Ooh. I moved to the States without knowing anything about this new group that I was going to be part of. So when I moved, I came with the United Nations to continue in my global mobilization circuit. I had a very precise agenda, which is to create and advance the sustainable development goals. And so very international and multilateral, if you want. And I started hearing on the side when I moved to New York, like, you're Latina. And I was like, what do you mean Latina? You're Hispanic. What do you mean Hispanic? What is that? And who invented that world because, a word? Because I'm a happy Mexican. That's what I know. I never heard that word before, Hispanic. And I know that for Latinos and for everybody living in the States, you forget that that's an invention. It doesn't exist anywhere else in the world to be all of a sudden associated, whether you're Mexican, Colombian, Venezuelan, or all of a sudden you're Hispanic. Mm -hmm. And so I started getting curious about that new group that I was going to belong to. But it is when I married an American that I really said, like, wait a second, this is personal. Now this agenda, because of my choice, now my daughter is going to be making 50% of the salary. She's predetermined because of my choice to have all the limitations that she doesn't earned. So this should, like, it just like happened to be that she's absorbing a massive overlap on her choices because Latinas are the most underpaid, least respected, and most undervalued group in the entire country. And that's when it really became clear to me that I needed to be all about Latinos. I didn't know anything about Latinos until seven years ago. I didn't even know that that word existed. So it is because I married an American that I was going to forget about my diplomatic life, moving from one country to the other, like the last 25 years of my life where I was in Europe, that I, um, that I decided to vest my uh, my time and my effort and my passion in what I think it is totally possible, which is to make sure that every Latino is seen and heard and valued. So this was strategic? No, no, it was not strategic. I mean, like, I, I, I happened to fall in love with my husband, you know, like, <laughs> like, that was not strategic. It just, like, happened to be that love is love. But no, 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 no not at all. It was not a strategic. It was that, look, I'm a marketer, and I've been a marketer my entire life mm -hmm. for social causes. So I've been trying to win the hearts and minds of people to do the right thing, the things that are good for you personally, but also for the planet and for the people and for our communities. So I've done that for refugees, for health, uh, for maternal mortality, for tobacco, for all kinds of social causes. And when I moved to America and I started realizing this community that I was going to belong to, I realized, wait a second, this is the first time in my life that I have a reverse marketing problem. 
it's not the product that is wrong. It's the packaging. Latinos are wonderful. Mm. We're beautiful. Look at the data. I mean, we keep on making this country move. We are growing like crazy. We're producing. We're paying our taxes. We're like, we're the youth. We're everything. But our packaging puts us in a very different light. So whomever is doing the marketing for the Latino community, I thought, is doing everything possible to hide our attributes, to hide that we are entrepreneurs, that we are job creators, that we pay our taxes, that we're hard workers, that we care. Mm. So that's when it became, for me, fundamental to say, like, I would literally bang my head on the walls if knowing what I know, if I am able to, if I've been able to mobilize millions and millions of people country after country to do things that I wouldn't invest that into the Latino community. Mm. So it was more than anything. It was one of those in which, you know, you have to do it because Mm. it's our time. I love that. So you are in an interesting space right now. You are about to embark on becoming a entrepreneur and you are launching a liquor line, right? Right. Se llama Sotol. Right. Okay. (laughs) And I love this because I love when we come from a background of corporate America or public service or organizing activism. And then we choose to bet on ourselves in such a way where I feel is the ultimate true ownership of your life. And I would love for you to talk to us about why you decided to make this decision. And as a new founder about to embark on this tremendous endeavor, like what are the thoughts going on in your head? So I was always an entrepreneur. I worked for the United Nations, UNICEF, the World Economic Forum, the largest and most prestigious organizations forever, the Mexican government and so on. And I was always the one causing disruption (laughs) within. Yeah, yeah. And I was actually recognized for that and put into the creation of masterpieces that could disrupt the industries where we are so that we can make, make change faster. From moving from an entrepreneur to a social entrepreneur, which is what I am today, it took a while. It it really panicked me because I didn't know how to be without an organization behind me. And there was one story that all of a sudden popped in my mind when I was like trying to decide on moving towards the Latino agenda as opposed to the UN agenda, which is I saw my resume and it just all of a sudden hit me. I was the right hand of someone my entire life and the great guys, by the way. But all of a sudden I started thinking about my dad was a civil engineer and he built highways in Mexico. So he always took me from Mexico to Acapulco, Mexico to Ixtapa and so on to check his highways. And he always told me like, ay, mija, what a great co-pilot you are because I knew how to do the maps. There was no GPS at the time. And so it was the maps and you folded it. I was like very good at like to the right, to the left and folded the papers so well. And he always told me like, I'll take you to my next trip with me because you're such a great co-pilot. And without any intention, he basically imprinted that voice in my head that was my role is to be a co-pilot, the right hand of someone. So when all of a sudden, five, seven years ago, I decided, what about I want to be the pilot of my Latino agenda? Mi gente, I've got the perfect freebie for you. So I just dropped a 17-page workbook to help you get your mind right, especially in this climate of so much uncertainty. So if you are an aspiring or current entrepreneur and you're just feeling stuck, you're not feeling too good about what the future holds and all the turmoil, the politics, all of it is just throwing you off your game, this workbook is actually going to Act as a journal for you. It covers goal setting, efficiency tips, how to manage your time, financial management tips, strategies on how to wrap your head around the next big thing that's coming down the pipeline to bring you consistent revenue in your business. It covers what you should be doubling down on in terms of your well being. And it is just my favorite jam packed journal full of marketing and sales strategy to help you get clarity, but most importantly, to help you secure the business. Bag. So make sure to tap on the link in the show notes. I've linked it there so that you guys can get really clear on the top hacks that you can put into play in 2024 to set yourself up for success. I hope you love it. It took me a lot to change my root belief 
that my father gave me and just like simply say thanks, but I do want to move into being a pilot. But that takes a lot of while, like moving the personal barrier, the discovering of the voice and then the social barriers and then the cultural barriers that all Latinas are facing. It's quite an effort to become an entrepreneur. So I left the UN, set up the World Human Foundation with a lot of determination and not without fear, but I was not going to let fear taking the decisions of my life. And I saw that with my mom. My mom decided she was a basketball player. She had three kids and then she, you know, like couldn't be a basketball player anymore. Two of my siblings died. And so she she was a single mother with me and decided to become an economist. And so five years seen while she was an economist, serious job, she said, you know what? Honestly, I want to be an actress. So at 45, everybody told her, are you crazy? No, no, no. And I saw her go and try her luck and be an actress. And I saw firsthand that she was doing it. And it's not that she was not scared. She was petrified. But it was not, she was not going to let fear take the decisions of her life. It's not that she was fear free, but she was, she was not fearless, but she was fear free. And so for me, it was similar by moving towards creating the World Human Foundation and the same principle of being able to say, I'm going to be the pilot of my own destiny and I'm going to do it fear free, not fearless, but fear free is what I'm jumping on to becoming an entrepreneur in a very male dominated industry, in an industry that I have no idea of and uh, start commercializing the Sotol that my family has been producing for the last 40 years. Why? I think that I America has a lot to do with it. The entire idea of the American dream, seeing how I think that the very thing that I'm selling, if you want, as the image of Latinos is that we are entrepreneurs. Every one in every five small businesses in America is a Latino. We have 45 percent of the small businesses in this country. The very image that I would like everyone to have about, you know, like Latino is the small business, is entrepreneur. And there's something that is very liberating to be a Latina in this country as opposed to Mexico or Colombia or Venezuela, which is you can do it here. We're 50% of the Latino population, 32 million Latinas. We take 85% of the purchasing decisions of our families. We produce more than $500 billion as entrepreneurs. And I took a decision like, I want to be one of them. I want to be able to control my wealth. I want to be able to produce. I want to be able to use my entrepreneurial spirit to bring it to market. But also, I think that I have an obligation to my family and to my country. My family has been leading this new category of alcohol that is going to be the next big thing for sure after tequila and mezcal the the story of the family is wonderful and i i want to be doing the legacy for my family and with that set an example for the many latinas young latinas that have to have every time more role models about how can you break it into into, into industries where we're normally not present and do it well a lot of our Viewers, audience members, listeners, they are aspiring or current entrepreneurs and can relate to wanting to build a legacy, to wanting to put your family on the map, to wanting to be fear free. Pero we know that preconditioning can sometimes stand in our way or sometimes we are our own worst enemy. So can you talk about some of the internal thoughts that were kind of perhaps shying you away from taking on this risk or making you doubt, like, can you really do it? Did you experience those kind of thoughts? Oh, I keep on doing that. I am going for it with shaking legs, understanding that I, I have been my entire life just one thing, just an activist. That's Everything I know, I've been doing, you know, same wine, different bottle my entire life, but I've been a marketer for social causes. And I know how to do really well. I know how to build brands. I know how to mobilize people. I know how to convey a dream and have people see it and follow it and, and make social change. Now, that's very different than, than you know, like selling alcohol and bottles <laughs> and so on. Yeah. But at the end of the day, I also want to make sure that we take control of our own destinies, that we empower the 
more Latinas are wealthy and successful, the more we can invest in the other entrepreneurs that are out there that lack the very preconditions that entrepreneurs have in this country. We don't have access to capital. We don't have access to navigation skills. We don't have the bankers that have been friends of our family forever. We don't have the friends and family capital and knowledge that most entrepreneurs that make in this country are. Because while there's an American dream, a lot of it is status quo. A lot of the entrepreneurs and small and like and businesses that make it are coming from the same entrepreneurs that have made it for generations. Mm -hmm. And like we need to make sure that if we have an idea, we can transform it into the next level, which is the friends and family round by people like you that get you. And I want to be able to be in a position where I am making it, not only to give an example and to make it myself, but also to be able to pass it forward. Because that's how we're going to be able to elevate who we are. The success of an entrepreneur in a large degree depends on the network you have. And I think that that's 40% of it as a fact. So the more Latinas are successful as entrepreneurs, the more we're going to be able to tie and to bring everybody forward. So I'm trusting that Latina entrepreneurs out there are going to support Latinas like me getting into an entrepreneur position and saying like, Kill, kill the fear. Come on. Don't have the imposter syndrome. Go for it. If you have an idea, develop it properly. Um, know what the steps are because we are so entrepreneurial, but we don't scale up. We remain in two to three employees, if at all. We have a side gig and we're a, unable to generate more than $1 million in revenue. Like only 3% of all the entrepreneurs, Latino entrepreneurs, generate more than $1 million revenue. How do we break that down? How do we make more than, you know, more, like that 3%, make it 10%? Mm -hmm. And that comes from you know, like access to capital, access to understanding, access to um, networks. And that's what I hope that I can, you know, like I can see and I can do and then I can share. So you touched on a couple of things that I want to take a deeper dive in. But first, I want to start with you are choosing to do it scared, you said, with shaking legs. What What is your process? What is your your formula or your toolkit that you're using to help you combat some of that self-doubt or fear? So first is understanding. I did go through the Latino business, like Elban and the Slay course mm -hmm. that um, is available for entrepreneurs. So I did some sort of training uh, on, on how to build the World Human Foundation. Once I got, I, I was advocating hard for myself to be able to be in a training course for entrepreneurs, even though I was not one, so that I could build the World Human Foundation and scale it mm -hmm. so that it could really lift the the the, the the mission that we were uh, set to accomplish. So some sort of training allowed me to believe, allowed me to believe that I can do it. I am not taking unnecessary risks that could jeopardize um, either my activities, my reputation, my capital. I am doing so, so like, because knowledge is so key, information is so key, and I'm surrounding myself by people that are entrepreneurs that are able to share some advice that is clearer and better for me to understand that what I hear from people that are like, what, what? I just went to a webinar. I, I didn't understand 10% of what everybody <laughs> said, but talking to a friend that has gone through the same probably gives me more information in half the time. So I think that being informed allows me to feel more confident. I think that having access to capital at the beginning of your journey really, really helps. And I am building up a network of the people that will help me scale, but also of the, of the people that I can learn from and uh, sell to. So I think that that's sort of like the key, but 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 in in reality, is the voices in your head that we need to but that we need to procure for. So while it's like, like once you have the hard core, like okay, access to capital, access to networks, access to information. Now the reality is like I'm still afraid. I'm still self doubt. I've never done. The, I'm the first woman in my family that gets into the alcohol business. I am taking calculated risks, but 
since I have a podcast myself called A La Latina, The Playbook to Succeed Being Your Authentic Self, I have learned a lot from trailblazers that have made it. And they say, you need to take risks. At the end of the day, you need to take calculated risks. And uh, those are the voices that I try to make bigger than mine. Describe what is a calculated risk to you. So right now, I would say I'm in getting into the alcohol category. Mm-hmm. And um, I am looking at the consumer data that says there's more than 600 million bottles of tequila sold every month. Um, and that um, that growth of uh, tequila that is a $9 billion industry is followed by mezcal, which is a much lower volume category, but is growing 14% and is calculated to be growing 14% a year for the next 10 years. So if I look at that, I'm like, okay, I'm in the winning category because Mexican spirits are attractive to people. Um, because if I look at the rest, which is, I'm very data driven. And I think that I recommend to every entrepreneur to be data driven and to understand what is it because data turns on lights. And when you're like seeing what's happening, you're able to take decisions with more clarity so that your, your few, like the few dollars that we have, we can invest properly. Um, I'm looking at beer going down. I'm looking at wine going down. People are tired of uh, consuming sugar. So they want healthier. They want more authentic. They want more Mexico, more Latino. Latino is in brand. You know, like number one beer in the country is Modelo, not because we drink a lot, but because everybody wants to be a little Latino and they like Latino products. Mm-hmm. So I'm looking at that data and say like, okay, I'm in a winning category. And so Tol is... Um, is rare, it's almost like a tequila, but healthier and more rare to find. The cactus is different, it's called Dacilirium. And so while agave, while agave is really popular and people understand it, so Tol is a male and a female and it's very hard to pollinate. And so you need winds which don't happen in the desert in Mexico and then there's bats. So the fact that you have already like babies of these sotols makes it almost like a miracle drink. And then you put that that is in the Sierra and the mountains of the Sierra in the desert. It's really hard to get this. So this is going to be a precious and very selective thing. So it is almost like for, for people that care about Mexican spirits, but know that there's very exclusive, very rare uh, drinks so of being a marketer I'm dreaming I'm of li- the I literally am listening to you and I'm like look at this marketer go you are just exactly. spitting it out I love exactly. it exactly yes. so I'm excited yeah. uh, on the risk that I'm taking because I know I'm in the right category that I can build a story based on not only my family 40 years of family but I'm in the winning category and I'm not going to invest more or I'm not going to hire more than what I know I can be building little by little. So even like the risk that I'm taking is I'm not going to go crazy and put everything in. I'm going to see for the far, for the first couple of years, the growth organic, and then uh, find the partners that can help me scale. You have made the decision to use your own money to, I guess, plant the seed and start this thing. Why did you make that decision? Sonoro presents a production of Malca Studios. A la Latina, the playbook to succeed being your authentic self. This is your chance to get first-hand career advice from the most accomplished Latinas in corporate America. Those ready to share their secrets so that you can make it to the top in half the time. Those who shatter the glass ceilings not despite being Latinas, but because of it. Join Claudia Romo Edelman and myself, Cynthia Kleinbaum-Milner, as we interview executives from Google, Coca-Cola, Spotify, and more. Learn how to get promoted quickly, when is it okay to make a lateral move, and how to use your accent as your superpower. The time has come for us to rise to the top. Being Latina is our superpower. We are passionate. We are resilient. We are natural leaders. We are the next generation of C-suite executives in the making. Join A La Latina. A La Latina is available wherever you listen to podcasts. Mi gente, I need your help. Look, the real game behind podcasts is... 
We need to really understand our demo, aka you, our audience, so that when we go out to sponsors who help us put on this amazing show and deliver this content to you, that they can clearly understand who we serve and what is significant to you and what you value. And the only way for us to get that information is for you to give it to us. So we just created this survey. I'll put it in the show notes. It will take you less than three minutes, literally, but it will be so helpful for us to get a better understanding of what it is that you care about what's important to you what do you value so that when we're out in these streets trying to secure the big bag and get sponsors for this show they know exactly who our audience is and what you care about so we can bring you the best products we can bring you the best organizations that are out here serving the cultura the community you so please take a moment and fill out the survey i'll link it in the show notes appreciate you control I think that a lot of the a lot of the times um, Latinos we don't have the fortune to be in control. We don't have the fortune to have our own media organization. So someone else is telling our story. We don't have the fortune to be in control of our finance. So someone else is determining how much are we gonna make or not in money. No, I am. I have been working and I have the 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 incredible privilege to be able to have capital to deploy. And if I trust myself and I look at the data correctly, I don't want to dilute my control. I don't want to dilute my power until I need it and until it's strategic. It's not that I'm not going to take any money at the beginning, but the majority of the money will be mine. And I will allow my friends and family that want to trust me and want to support me to put little pieces. But I want to be in control as much as I can so that I can make more. (laughs) <laughs> right. And also make the decisions. <laughs> and make the, take the decisions, yeah. Right? So a lot of noise is made around raising funds. You see the headlines where people are like, oh, this entrepreneur just raised $5 million in this round, and they're about to go into their second round. And you see headlines like that, and you're like, oh, wow, that's incredible. They're doing so incredible. And I find that entrepreneurs don't understand the control piece. They don't understand what happens when you do accept money from somebody else and allow them to kind of come into your space because now they have a voice in what happens in that company because you're using their money. What is really interesting about your story, and I'm so excited that you're here because I'm learning more and more about you as we continue to chat, is you are choosing to self-invest, but you do have access to a lot of capital. Like you have an incredible network and you're still making the decision to be like, no, I'm good. I'm going to do this on my own. What do you have to say to people who have this misconception that if you have a network with people with money and you have some money because you've had a very lucrative career, that you are dumb for using your own money to build a project? It depends. Look, I I wouldn't want to judge everybody's decision. I just know that for me, the most important thing that I have is clarity. Clarity about where I stand, where I need to do, where to do it. Every one of us have limited resources. And I, my entire life, I've been on the, on the poor side of life, right? Like for all the organizations that I work for, they had no resources, very few dollars. We needed to work with nothing. And it taught me to be very disciplined about my interventions and my investments. So if I was working for UNICEF and I needed, you know, 190 countries to mobilize and say, yes, we're going to do a campaign for vaccines. How do you do that when you have no money? That's the kind of of thinking that it gives you when you're like when you're res- like when you're restricted in resources you have to be very clear about where to go so that you don't spend it wrongly and i know that the data that i just shared about like i am clear about the category is growing my own product is really good i have very limited capacity i don't have thousands of bottles. I have very few bottles that my family produces, and I don't want to go beyond that because it would require a a, a dramatic amount of investment of something that I don't know if it's going to be well received to the market. That's my calculated risk. Now, what do I have? I have a great network. I also know that I can build brands and create boss and make things like emotional. I, I am able to create cool because of my my marketing material, my marketing background. So what do I do with that? Then I say like, all right, so for me, it would make no sense to go through the entire chain of 
uh, investing a lot to produce more without knowing to go to the market, I'm going to use my network and sell the little bottles that I have and place them as exclusive. I'm going to go into private events. I'm going to be serving the jet set of uh, America that wants to try and taste the Mexican modern luxury to build my business model. And there's many other business models. That's why I want to keep my own control and say like, okay, what do I have and how do I make it work? All right. If I hit the 1% of the population with my Sotol because I can because of my network, then I think that I'm going to be saving 50% of the money that I would be spending that I can use to produce more, that I can use later on to bring more investments. At some point, I'm going to need a lot of, a lot of investment to scale, but not right now. So I wouldn't challenge anybody getting their own strategy about like whether they need investment or not. What I know is that for me, having the clarity of why do what I need money? Do I need it? No, I can I can loophole it. Like like when you don't have a lot of resources, you're very uh, trained to find loopholes and see where you are. And I'm trying to find them in order to scale without a lot of risks. Mm-hmm. Does you're that make scrappy. sense? Yes. You're like scrappy. You're like going through what you have. I love it. This sounds amazing. Did you come up with this plan on your own? Like, what was the process of you getting here to now having the strategic vision? Okay, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to jet set. This is what I'm going to focus on. Like, how did you get here? I've been working on this two years. I've been learning and studying and data and doing a lot of homework on numbers. And again, it's data. Understanding how do you make margin? What, what is it like? Is there a volume play game that I want to play or is it a margin game that I want to play? I never knew that there was a word called margin or volume. I've been a social entrepreneur, never having any money. So I'm learning and sitting down and watching podcasts and understanding a little bit more because I was never an entrepreneur. I'm not even an entrepreneur, but I am learning as much as I can, as no, fast are. as I can. You own that title. Oh, I you am a, are. I am an entrepreneur. Thank you very Ladies much. and gentlemen, Claudia <laughs> Romo Edelman, entrepreneur. Thank you very much. Um, <laughs> uh, it's the first time I say that ever Punto. in my life. Punto. Um, <laughs> so I'm learning a lot. I'm also getting into places where people are because the network, again, matters dramatically. And I would say, again, using my Latinidad as my superpower to build the business model that will help me. Not the gringos and the distributors or the stores. No, I want to favor me, my country, my farmers, my my bartenders, like the people that, and I'm building that in. And I'm definitely going to build my business plan looking at my country, the sustainability of the plants, taking care of the farmers so that there's no way that a family in Mexico is suffering from the exploitation of Sotol and the decelerium. I'm going to make sure that a profit of the Sotol that I'm building is going to the people that serve it because the bartenders and the waiters are going to be my sales force. I'm not going to use like, like gringos to sell my product. I'm going to use my waiters, the people that are like moving this country because we deserve that type of mentality of I'm going to grow if everybody grows. Mexican woman that cares about Latinos and cares about you and you're going to have a profit of this, a piece of the ownership of my company. Which one do you think are going to sell? Which one are they going to push? This is the mentality of unity. This is where you bring that genuine voice to make your brand appealing and something that people want to be part of. What I think is so critical to highlight in this moment is your skill set of social activism and mobility and collaboration and understanding the social components of humans <laughs> is going to serve you so well in this endeavor. Like there's so many transferable skill sets that you are going to be able to apply to this. Almost like you have been training yourself for this moment. <laughs> I love it. You've been training yourself for this moment and all those skill sets are now going to amplify your movement. And listen, you guys are hearing it first on Banking on Cultura because yeah. Gloria has never spoken about this publicly in this way anywhere else. So you guys are hearing it first and we got to have you back once we like reach the next phase. We're going to have some sotal over here. We're going to have some drinks. Um, so make sure you guys follow along on the journey and support what is happening here because this this is like the roots like you're planting the roots and the seeds and now we're going to watch it come to fruition which i love 
There's one more piece yes. that I failed to say. So my first group of investors outside friends and family, I will devote a, a, a trunk. Because I think that as Latinas, we don't have chances to invest small pieces in, in pieces that, you know, like things that are either interesting or that you're like, I want to be part of this because I believe in it and I want to give money. And I want to say, I'm an investor. I want to hear more and more Latinas that are like all the things that you said, like badass and sassy and classy <laughs> and all that, saying like, I'm an investor in something. And we don't have enough opportunities because all of those opportunities to invest in the things that are good are giving to the same group of people. It's like the social, uh, the, the status quo, like, you know, continuing in, in their growth. And I want to make sure that that's like, that's a piece. So yeah, stay tuned because I'll open it up at some point. I love it. I'm going to open it up here on Banking on Cultura. <laughs> y ya. There's one thing I want to touch on, and then we'll move into the Talk That Talk segment. You have a full-time job. You're a wife. You're a mom. You are a friend. All the things. Where did you find the time to think about this plan for Sotol? Did you commit to, okay, I'm going to dedicate five hours a week to working on this plan? Because you've been doing this for two years, you said. So how did you discipline yourself to make sure that this is happening so it's it's um it's a question that i think that a lot of my team would like to me to be more disciplined on and about so i had two years of exploration with total flirting and seeing so i i brought 500 bottles to see how they performed i did a lot of parties i saw how my friends committed to it and how literally i was like wow people don't leave the Sotol. Like once you start, they never change for an entire night. And I started making jokes and games like, okay, drink half a bottle. And if you have a headache, I'll pay you money the day after. And things like that. And I started bringing it to places. And so I felt I know the product. I can relate to it. I feel proud about my family story. I feel proud about how this behaves in people's minds. So once I stopped doing the flirting, if you want, I needed to move to a commitment time. And that's when my, I, I dance like a Mexican, but I work as a Swiss. So I pretty much, I was like, okay, so I'm going to give myself this amount of hours a week so that I can start thinking about it. Um, I have a very non-ambitious a plan for Sotol. So it's like, how do I take it forward for the next 24 months? Because I know that I have other obligations. So I have to constantly, you know, like this is exciting. So I'd love to like devote 20 hours a day to it, but I have to discipline myself because I have a foundation that is going to, that is going through a transition now. And the leadership team, they have a, ma a massive and senior uh, leadership team. The C-suite of the World Human Foundation is taking over and is, is growing and scaling, but you can't drop the baby. It's too fast. So I am putting hours to transition. I'm putting hours to enter into the Sotol. I'm putting hours, of, I'm just like very clear about like what needs to happen now. What needs to happen later? What needs to happen here and there? But it's a matter of discipline, which I, I'm trying to exercise because this is very exciting. Like I'm, I'm clear what needs to happen and then I'm planning accordingly, which is again, something that I know that my team would like me to do even more. <laughs> you say you dance like a Mexican, but work like a Swiss? W what does that mean? I, you don't want to see my calendar. <laughs> Like I literally have everything. I am so routinary. Like I have routines. I have, you know, like I, I dream it, plan it, do it. Dream it, plan it, do it. So, and I check on how do I do that constantly. I am a planning bee. So I, I know my minutes are the most precious commodity that I have to care for. So I don't leave a lot of space for anything else that is not planned. So I, I, in that way, I am very like structured in what is not in my calendar. It doesn't happen in my life. So I plan everything. Routine. What does that look like? Like today, what's your routine? Well, every day is the same day in a way. It's the same. So I wake up every day at 6.15. At 6.30, I'm exercising. At 7.30, I'm taking a shower. At 7.45, I have a uh, breakfast with my daughter at eight o'clock I drive her to her school I come back and while I'm coming back because I drive uh, I know people don't drive in New York I love driving <laughs> there's the Mexican in me <laughs> um, at 8 15 I'm having my first call 
every day with the uh, with the CEO of the World Human Foundation at 8:45. I have a tea, uh, like an organizing meeting with my team, and then the day moves on. I cannot tell you how much exercise means to me, how much uh, this is structure it gives me. Um, I am a very quota-driven person, so I have dinner every Tuesday with my daughter. I have every Wednesday I go out with my husband. And we do culture most of the time with a dinner, and I um, most of the time I try to you know like see the pieces like okay so what needs I have weekly uh, I have weekly meetings with the people that I need to check in whether it's my family or my son or my work on on see progress very dashboard driven if you want like how are you are you exercising are you okay it's like <laughs> doctors okay let's move on how are you how are you exercising and so that's pretty much my my day my weekends now are very filled with my daughter's volleyball she's a volleyball player and I have been traveling the country going with her um, and so I am very routinary values uh, and principles driven so if I say family first it looks like that's the way it looks in my routine as well mm. is there ever opportunity to be spontaneous so I think that I have the 80 20 uh, rule for all my life where I try to have 80% of everything I do in control and allowing that 20% for the things that I try to a eat 80% of the time healthy and 20% of the time not. So I have to choose what is that 20% and how do I use it and, and so on. So if I overdo it or I underdo it, so it's a 90-10, so you adjust. So, so the same, I try to have my life in 80% planned and then 20% of the time that I can say like, look, I didn't think of this, but why don't we go to this? Or I'd like to, I'd like to now that my daughter is going to college, I'd like to add more space i think that for spontaneous things but i i do like the routine i have to say i do like feeling confident on the, that i have a structure where i stand and in control that that allows me to have the drive and the discipline that i need to achieve the things that i want to and if one of the things that i want to achieve is to have fun <laughs> it falls into that as schedule well schedule it <laughs> schedule it pretty much i mean like pretty much yeah i love it so let's move into the talk that talk segment so you mentioned your father would often say you're like a great co-pilot. You're an amazing like teammate to have. And a lot of Latinas find themselves in positions where they are the number two or the number three, depending on what's happening and are very comfortable in that space. What are your thoughts about Latinas choosing to no longer be the co-pilot, move to being the pilot, what is your advice for those who are looking to make that transition but are struggling because culturally they've been taught that this is how you should be and this is okay. This is your norm. There are for for changes like that from moving to copilot from copilot to pilot, um, which I one thousand percent is the case for many people. Uh, that you want to be a pilot. It's not if you want to be a co-pilot, it's all great, right? Like it's a, it's a perfectly fine role. I'm not criticizing it. I I actually loved it for many many years. I think that we have to recognize and be able to bring to the awareness the barriers that we face, and I find them in three categories: cultural, social, and then personal. Cultural barriers are the ones that are easier to shake off, although it's hard because they are ingrained in our culture and our environments. They're, we don't have the enabling environments enough to shake them off. For example, calladita te ves más bonita. Mm -hmm. Culturally, you're not prone to be successful. You're prone to be the wife or the accompanying person of someone. So that's a cultural expectation. And so I think that a methodology that works for me is to understand the root belief and give, put it in three categories. Do I take you? Do I change you? Do I give you back? So do I take you? Um, Callita, te ves más bonita? Really? Uh, nah, I'll change you. Calladita, te ves más bonita? Sometimes. For me, sometimes it's good to be calladita, te ves más bonita, because honestly, I just don't want to get engaged in certain conversations where I know I have a much better winning strategy than just talking. 
So I do that a lot with my husband, for example, <laughs> and that kind of thing where he's like, la, la, la. And I'm like, mm -hmm. can we go there then? You know, like it's pretty much, you know, like I think that we know, we know. Yes. So, but you have to make those choices and say like, let me bring to the awareness those cultural barriers that are stopping me from jumping into things. And do I take it? Do I change it? Do I reject it? And say like, no, honestly, I just don't want, thank you, grandmother for all your wisdom that was great at that time not anymore and i'm giving it back to you with love the social barriers are the ones that we see constantly through others like the media where we are portrayed and that is crazy for me we're portrayed in the perception of latinas is so negative for us and people don't even realize it i just did a for my social media, I did an interview on the streets of New York and I went with a paper saying like Latinas are, um, and I, I listed a number of attributes, beautiful, sexy, loud, hard workers, entrepreneurs, uh, homeowners, and then hard workers and so on. So uh, physical competence and values. Everybody to my face said, Latinas are beautiful, sexy, and fire. And I was like, <laughs> As a compliment, mm. people think that it is great that we're associated with that. What what doesn't come to life is understanding not only that we're the job creator number one in the country, that Latinas generate small businesses six times faster than any other group in America, and that if we're not seen as intelligent, hard workers or potential homeowners, our salaries depend on that. Our, because the unconscious biases of companies are like, okay, I'll put you in the reception, I guess, because you're so beautiful and sexy. And so it's that social stereotyping that it's, it's a, like it's really evil hidden on a precious thing. So we need to make sure as Latinas that we are aware that we might look beautiful, but we need to talk smart. We need to be sexy and deliver homeowner deliver job creators and we need to repeat that again and again hi i'm claudia romo edelman and my group generates six times faster than any other group in america small businesses we have to say it because that brings the conscience of people and so those social barriers need to be brought to the attention like brought brought to our awareness that we have that perception and then try to combat it by not hiding that we're beautiful or sexy but just like pushing the other elements as well it's almost like if a brand would be only its uh, its attribute like for example i don't know like a toothpaste and you're like oh yeah it has acid fluorine blah, blah, blah. and you're like yeah yeah but you want more this provides you a smile and this gives you more right like we have to push that brand and the last piece i think is the personal voices what i just said about my dad and the pilot and the co-pilot every one of us has a story every one of us has been told something that puts us in a bucket where you have to take a take conscious and say like wait dad Thank you so much for allowing me to believe that I was a great co-pilot as a kid. I know I was a great co-pilot in managing the map. I want to be a pilot and I'm sure that you're fine with that because you never intended to limit me with that belief. But I want to change it to a new belief that allows me to believe that I could be the pilot of my own story. And with that, then you can start backing it with evidence. We create more small businesses than anyone else. Once we reach a million dollars, the likelihood is we're gonna get to 10. And if you start looking at the data, you have everything to believe that this is our time and that Latinas can make it. Mm, I'm, I'm so like inspired right now. <laughs> I'm so ready to like take over the world. Uh, and this is why I wanted to introduce Claudia to this community because this is exactly how I felt when I saw you speak on that stage. It literally is like every single time. And as I'm listening to you, I'm observing and I'm like, wow, like the, the communication style, the clarity, the authenticity and the competence in how you present and how you speak is so powerful. And, and I'm just like literally a student right now as I'm listening to you. So thank you so, so much. So tell the people about A La Latina, which is your podcast, so that they can tune in. And then also, what are you doing with the foundation? A La Latina, the playbook to succeed being your authentic self, came about through the understanding that we are getting stuck in corporate America. We're not getting promoted to the C-suite. So we're getting entry jobs. We're managing to get to middle level 
but we're not getting higher. And so therefore there's no pipeline for corporate boards and so on. So we started looking at why. Why are we getting stuck at the at the higher level? Why are we not senior and leaders? Why are we not more in the C-suite? And we started counting and the, from the Fortune 500 companies, uh, there's only 50 Latinas that are in the C-suite, which is a disgrace. We're 30 million Latinas, only 50 in the C-suite. So we wanted to change that. It doesn't mean that there's only 50, but we could only find 50. Um, many Latinas uh, hide their names and change their names, and so it's impossible to see unless they and unless you push them and they're ready to to uh, to say, tell their stories, which is what happened a couple of times already in the podcast. But so here's what we found: we found that there are three main reasons why this is happening. Number one is because Latinas do not have role models. Number two is because they don't have networks that support them in the promotion. That means no network, no mentors, no sponsors, and so on, no one guiding you. And number three, we don't have the playbook. And this is an important one because most of us are the first gens, the first generation to get to college, the first generation that is making this amount of money, the first generation that is getting to the positions where we are. So we don't come with manuals. It's not that your grandfather told you, this is how you do, this is how you manage your millions of dollars, amiga. Mm -hmm. Like you don't have that. So we need the playbooks because we get into an environment and we're like, how do I navigate this? How do I navigate being senior? How do I behave? How do I, what are the, what are the things that I need to know so that I can get promoted? So we created the podcast very specifically to get the stories and the playbooks from those 50 women that have made it to corporate America. And it's not only how they made it, but made it being your authentic self. Because the other piece of us is that we suppress our Latinidad. If you're Jorge, you pretend to be George, uh, you come to work with someone you don't even know. And that is so bad for our soul. It's like we start bleeding and cutting ourselves little, little by little. And then, and then your soul is so fragmented and sad that it's hard to recover from that. And then you're going to move immediately to a place where you feel welcome. So we needed to make sure that we understand how to get more Latinas to the top in half the time with half the bruises. And that's why we created the world, the, the A La Latina podcast. We moved the A La Latina podcast from season one to season two. And also we created the A La Latina network, which is the network of those trailblazers, those 50 women, so that they can get to know each other, exchange with each other, be better leaders, but also give it back to the next, the next gen so that we can create a pipeline of young people that want to be there. So we had a la Latina podcast, a la Latina network with dinners that we started doing. So we had our a la, a, a la Latina network, a, a la Latina dinner in New York, where we had this incredible group of trailblazers, 10 trailblazers, 50 Hispanic star rising that created that network. And at some point, the Latina trailblazers started talking to them about like, this is what I would have done if I would be like talking to myself 30 years, uh, my, myself in 30 years. It was moving, it was powerful, and I know the, that A La Latina as a podcast will grow into a network that will have events and conferences so that we can create that infrastructure that we need. It's almost like the YPO mm -hmm. for Latinas that want to make it to the top in half the time will have the bruises. Mm, I love that. And then with the foundation, the work that you are doing there? The foundation is very much set up to mobilize corporate America and equip corporate America. So we are a little bit like the Pepe Grillo that goes and talks to the corporate America and say like, hey, did you know that with Latinos you can grow your businesses more? Did you know that if you hire Latinos, you're going to be able to attract more? That Do you know that there's no way you can sell or hire without our community? Do you know who to partner? Here's a list of all the partners that you can have. So we work as a strategic advisor to companies to mobilize and we work with 320 companies. And on the other side, we're working with the Latino community to elevate the self-regard and the social recognition. So that means we're working on Latino unity, pride, and access so that we can be in the places where we need to be. And we, we do it together so that we can advance more. Mm, I love it. So where can folks learn more about you and all the incredible work that you're doing? Social media. I am Claudia Romo Edelman. The foundation is worldhuman.org or hispanicsart.org. And I would love to invite all your guests to join A La Latina podcast. We have a LinkedIn community that is growing. And uh, listen to the podcast. It's really a uh, very straightforward and concrete type of advice if you want to, again, make it to the top and make it being your authentic self. 
We love it. Well, I'll make sure to include in the show notes where you can find Claudia. Thank you so much for joining us today. I learned so much. So I know our community has as well. And I can't wait to have you back on the podcast and also join you on this new adventure with Sotol and this new chapter. I'm so, so, so excited for you. And know that I'm here to support you in any way that I can and banking on cultura and all that jazz because you said you're looking for Latinas to help and to invest and to take it to the next level. So here you go. You got uh, your first Latina. Let's thank go. you so much for <laughs> being the platform where I, for the first time ever, spoke about this. I know. So amazing. I didn't even know that. That's amazing. Yeah. I love it. All right, guys. Thank you so much for being here. I'll see you in the next episode. Hey guys, before you tune into today's episode, I want to tell you about an opportunity where you can secure between five and six figures in corporate and government contracts. Now I know this might sound a little intimidating, especially if you've never done business at this level, or maybe you don't have a corporate background. I'm here to tell you that all of that does not matter. Did you know that only 4% of women in business hit a million dollars in revenue? And of that 4%, 56% are able to hit a million dollars in revenue because they go after these contracts. So if a million dollars is on your vision board or just overall financial stability, corporate contracts is the way to go. I wanna invite you to enjoy me in my upcoming masterclass where I'm going to show you how to create a no-brainer offer so that executive buyers do not even question giving you their money. So who exactly is this class for? If you're a seasoned nine to fiver planning for her exit, but you're unsure where to start, but you are sure that you're done building someone else's dream instead of your own, this class is for you. If you're a new entrepreneur and just overwhelmed with everything that you need to learn and accomplish and seeking out a mentor who gets it and understands, I want to see you in class. This is also for seasoned entrepreneurs who are having challenges with driving consistent revenue into their business. Now, here's the reality. You have the smarts, you have the skill set, you have the ambition, you have the thought leadership to get paid. My job is to help you package your expertise so that it becomes a no brainer for people to pay you high five and six figure contracts. So click on the link below this video or in the show notes to get more details and to sign up for the class before we sell out. I cannot wait to see you there. Mi gente, did you enjoy this episode? Are you loving Banking on Cultura? Make sure to subscribe and follow us. Our goal is to grow this community so that we can all embrace our Latinidad, secure the big bag, and never question our cultura ever again. Please also take a moment to leave us a review. I love reading your reviews. Let me know what you are thinking, what guests we should have on, and if there are any topics you would like me to cover. I appreciate you so much for being here. Te amo mucho, and I'll check you out in the next episode.